Hello, my name is Saskia Ruysink and I coordinate the Cities Hub of the Leiden Delft Erasmus Center for Sustainability. After moving to Rotterdam in 2005, I've seen and experienced the city changing. While this change over roughly 15 years might not be representative for many other cities, it does raise questions about urban justice with a generic relevance. All cities have diverse and dynamic populations, activities and spatial configurations. And in all cities, a transdisciplinary approach is very important for unraveling the meaning of urban justice. In 2005, Rotterdam had a declining population. In comparison to the rest of the Netherlands, the population had a low average income, a low average level of education and high crime rates. I've heard many times that students of the Rotterdam Erasmus University were inclined to leave Rotterdam as soon as they graduated. The city administration then developed strategies to reverse trends and change the image of Rotterdam. In December 2005, the city administration adopted the controversial Rotterdam Act, in Dutch the Rotterdamwet. This provided a legal basis to ban people who live less than six years in Rotterdam and who have a low income from registering in certain neighborhoods or streets. The act was developed to deconcentrate the accumulation of social challenges in certain parts of the city by intervening in who could settle where. Around 2014, the city of Rotterdam also developed policy measures to attract highly educated individuals and families to the city of Rotterdam with a policy program that's labeled as Strong Shoulders and another program focusing explicitly on attracting young families to centrally located urban neighborhoods. The idea behind those policy measures is that having a higher percentage of highly educated people increases the socioeconomic diversity and improves the livability. It increases investments in housing and strengthens the local economy, social engagement and the capacity to self-organize. Currently, more than 15 years later, the population of Rotterdam is growing. The average income in Rotterdam has increased and the share of people with a low income has decreased. Also, the average level of education has gone up and the real estate market is booming, as in many other Dutch cities. The pressure on the housing market is clearly visible. And of course, it remains very hard to pin down why this change has happened. But let's assume it's a combination of policy regulation, including those that I just mentioned, strategic investments or disinvestments, general social economic development strengths, and momentum or timing. And rather than focusing on why those changes happened, we will question what the meaning of those changes is through an urban justice lens. In light of this, we can ask ourselves whether the policy measures that intended to trigger change in Rotterdam are justified. Many meaningful things have been written about urban justice, spatial justice, social justice and the right to the city. Susan Feinstein argues that a just city embraces the core values of equity, democracy and diversity. She admits that those values are abstract and that they can be even conflicting when operationalized in practice. Edward Soya focuses on the spatial dimension of justice, since he emphasizes that an equitable spatial distribution of resources, services and access is essential and even a human right. What does this mean in the light of developments in Rotterdam in the past 15 years? Certain policy goals might have been achieved. But has Rotterdam improved its spatial distribution of resources, services and access? And what about the changes in equity, democracy and diversity in Rotterdam? The changes in Rotterdam are being monitored by the municipality. An example is the monitoring via the neighborhood profiles. These profiles serve to measure the livability of neighborhoods and are composed of a physical, safety and social index. And a profile combines objective data, such as the number, number of burglaries and subjective data, such as experience safety. 
The profiles show that the overall situation in Rotterdam is improving. Another example is the publication of fact sheets by the municipality of Rotterdam. Some of those show that the share of higher educated people has increased in targeted neighborhoods. A recent evaluation commissioned by the national government looked at the effect of a number of more or less similar measures in various Dutch cities, including the Rotterdam Act. And this study also showed a positive effect. This, however, contrasts with a very thorough academic study carried out in 2015, where Horstenborg, Uitermark and Van Gent conclude that the Rotterdam Act had various effects, but did not result in better livability of the neighborhoods. Other academic and journalistic studies are also more critical and highlight the relatively recent process of gentrification in Rotterdam that includes voluntary and involuntary displacement of people, often the vulnerable. Additionally, there is a growing social movement of residents who demand that their needs are considered. A prominent example is the group that organized themselves in Rotterdam under the label Recht op de Stad, which means right to the city. A confrontation of the policy instrument, the results of the monitoring and evaluation studies, and the academic and journalistic studies with the conceptualization of urban justice raises questions. What is the meaning of urban justice in contemporary Rotterdam? And more precisely, what is the meaning and importance of diversity, equity and democracy? according to the different stakeholders in Rotterdam? And how should resources, services and access be distributed in Rotterdam? The follow-up question is where and how this is or can be achieved. And also, to what extent do current and past policy measures influence this? It is clear that different actors will give different answers to those questions. However, all those answers are important and need to be confronted and debated. And this will improve and expand our knowledge and understanding about urban justice. And while knowledge is not enough, it is a key dimension of enhancing urban justice. It's therefore important that urban justice is studied by engaging a variety of actors and by applying a transdisciplinary approach. This go be, goes beyond a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary or participatory approach. Academics from various disciplines are essential in addressing this subject matter. But so are the diverse group of policymakers with different professional backgrounds and ideologies, as well as the diverse group of residents and entrepreneurs who all have different needs and ideas. Those groups should work together on defining the research questions and deciding how this phenomena can best be studied. This requires combining, confronting and debating ideas. It also requires making academic knowledge and expertise more accessible for other non-academic actors and stakeholders. The accessibility can be improved by using different and less academic language by using research methods that are more accessible and also by simply publishing research results in open access journals and other open access platforms. It does not mean that more traditional academic studies or policy evaluations carried out by municipalities are not meaningful or important. I do not want to claim that a transdisciplinary approach is or should be the only way of studying urban justice or that it is easy and will result in all the solutions we need. But we do need to work more transdisciplinary than we currently do. We live in a time of complex challenges. We need to find ways to deal with climatic, ecological, political, health, social and many other crises. And it's timely to establish communities in various cities that gather people across stakeholder groups with different views and backgrounds to start addressing those crises by tackling a basic question. What is the meaning of urban justice in my city? And what is our call to action?